The Things They Carried On the Rainy R River This is one story I never told before, not to anyone, not to my parents, not to my brother or sister, not even to my wife. To go into it, I've always thought would only cause embarrassment for all of us. A sudden need to be elsewhere, which is the natural repro repo response to a confession. Even now, I'll admit this story makes me squirm. For more than 20 years, I've had to live with it, feeling the shame, trying to push it away, and so by this act of remembrance, by putting the facts down on paper, I'm hoping to relieve at least some of the pressure on my dreams. Still, it's a hard story to tell. All of us, I suppose, like to believe that in a moral emergency, we will behave like the heroes of our youth, bravely and forthrightly, without thought of personal loss or discredit. Certainly, that was my conviction back in the summer of 1968. Tim O'Brien, a secret hero, the Lone Ranger, if the stakes ever became high enough, if the evil were enough, if the good were en good enough, I would simply tap a secret reservoir of courage that had been accumulating inside me over the years. Courage, I seem to think, comes to us in finite quality quantities, like an inheritance, and by being frugal and stashing it away and letting it earn interest, we steadily re increase our moral capital and preparation for the day when the account must be drawn down. It was a comforting theory that dispensed with all those bore bothersome little acts of daily courage it offered hope and grace to the repetitive coward it justified the past while amortizing the future in june of 1968 a month after graduating from malcalister college i was drafted to fight a war i hated i was 21 years old young yes and politically naive but even so the american war in vietnam seemed to me wrong Certain blood was being shed for uncertain reasons. I saw no unity of purpose, no consensus on matters of philosophy or history or law. The very facts were shrouded in uncertainty. Was it a civil war, a war of national liberation, or simple aggression? Who started it and when and why? What really happened to the USS Maddox on that dark night in the Gulf of Tonkin? Was Ho Chi Minh a com communist stu stooge or a nationalist savior or both or neither? What about the Geneva Accords? What about CEATO and the Cold War? What about domino dominoes? America was divided on these and a thousand other issues, and the debate had spilled out across the floor of the United States Senate and into the streets, and smart men in p pinstripes could not agree on even the most fundamental matters of public policy. The only certainty that summer was moral confusion. It was my view then, and still is, that you don't make war without knowing why. Knowledge, of course, is always imperfect, but it seemed to me that when a nation goes to war, it must have reasonable confidence in the justice and imperative of its cause. You can't fix your mistakes. Once people are dead, you can't make them undead. In any case, those were my convictions, and back in college, I had taken a modest stand against the war. Nothing radical, not hothead stuff, just ringing a few doorbells for Jean McCarthy, composing a few tedious, uninspired editorials for the campus newspaper. Oddly, though, it was almost entirely an intellectual activity. I brought some energy to it, of course, but it was the energy that accompanies almost any abstract in Ever. I felt no personal danger. I felt no sense of impending crisis in my life. Stupidly, with a kind of a smug removal that I can be begin to fathom, I assumed that the problems of killing and dying did not fall with my special province. The draft notice arrived on June 17, 1968. It was a humid afternoon, I remember, cloudy and very quiet, and i just come in from a round of golf. My mother and father were having lunch out in the kitchen. I remember opening up the letter, scanning the first few lines, feeling the blood go thick behind my eyes. I remember a sound in my head. It was thinking, just a silent howl, a million things all at once. It was too good. I was too good for this war. Too smart, too compassionate, too everything. It couldn't happen. I was above it. I had the world dicked. Phi Beta Kappa and Summa Cum Laude and president of the student body and a full-ride scholarship scholarship for grad student studies at harvard a mistake maybe a foul up in the paperwork i was no soldier i hated boy scouts i hated camping out i hated dirt and tents and mosquitoes the sight of blood made me queasy and i couldn't tolerate authority and i didn't know a rifle
from a slingshot. I was a liberal, for Christ's sake. If they needed fresh bodies, why not draft some back to the Stone Age hawk? Or some dumb jingo in his head hat, in his hard hat, and bomb Hanoa button, or one of LBJ's pretty daughters, or Westmoreland's whole handsome family, nephews and nieces and baby grandson. There should be a law, I thought. If you support a war, if you think it's worth the price, that's fine. But it, if you have to put your own precious fluids on the line, you have to head for the front and hook up with an infantry unit and help spill the blood. And you have to bring along your wife or your kids or your lover a, a law, I thought. I remember the rage in my stomach. Later it burned down to smoldering self-pity, then to numbness. At dinner that night, my father asked what my plans were. Nothing, I said. Wait.